Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Uh, I love the fact you're teaching revival history. I hope you're using my book as a textbook. And so turning our nation back to God through historic revival. And people say, why, why study revival history? Because history is about his story. It's about Jesus, what he's done throughout the ages. And I love uh, Revelation 19.10, the spirit, the testament of Jesus' spirit of prophecy. So when you testify what God has done in your life now or what he's done in the past, you're prophesying, you're building up, you're building people's faith, you're building your faith. And, uh, and of course, this is such a prophetic house because of uh, Pastor Jennifer. I believe that she is a prophet. In fact, I encouraged her uh, to be commissioned as a prophet. And uh, Lord willing, we're going to commission her and Pastor Ron as an apostle uh, next year in April uh, with uh, Bill Johnson and Cindy Jacobs, myself, will be laying hands on them at the Global Summit. And it's a kingdom thing. It really is. And so I'm so excited about it. But it's so important because the reason why I read church history, because if God did this in the past, he could do it again in the future, but even greater. So this morning I shared how we go from glory to glory, and that's the way his kingdom works, from strength to strength, from faith to faith. And so he wants you to become more like him. He wants you to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. You know, I'm blown away by this one verse in 1 John 4, 17. Because in that passage, we know God is love. Verse 16 says, God is love. Uh, verse 19 says, we love because he first loved us. But right in between, he says in verse 17, as Jesus was in the world, so are you now. Yeah. Now think about that. As he was, you're now here to represent him, to be like him. And that blows me away. He expects you to be like Jesus. He is conforming you into his image, Romans 8, 29. And so when Jesus said, it's your advantage, I go away, because if I go away, I'll send the helper, the Holy Spirit. It's talking about the Spirit of God's going to come inside you, and you're going to be like Jesus to the world. Isn't that amazing? And, and so he expects us to continue the work he began. And what did he do? Well, he cast out demons, healed the sick, raised the dead. He said, freely you've received, freely give. So I want to talk about how we can move in this realm of the supernatural because I believe we're coming into an epic season of transformation. The Lord spoke that to me, and I shared this morning how we're seeing major things that we've been contending for for years. Like, can we thank God for Roe v. Wade being overturned? <laughs> After 49 years of praying, fasting, and contending, and marching, and giving, and all of a sudden, we're in our lifetime, this is historic. It would be just like living in 1833 when slavery was abolished altogether in Great Britain. It's just a historic. In fact, I want you to mark June 24th, 2022 down and remember that because I feel it's as important as October 31st, 1517. And what happened on that day is when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis on Wittenberg door and the Protestant movement began. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Martin Luther. And his whole message, we're saved by grace through faith. That is so foundational because I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how faith is a grace from God. And in order for us to move in the supernatural, we have to have faith. Of course, without faith, it's impossible to please him, right? And pastor just shared, uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. But in verse 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Now, how many of you want to please God? Come on. We all do. So he expects us to walk. The just shall live by faith. But how do we move in the kind of faith? And, and I, I wrote a book on um, how to pray for healing. And it's really uh, my best-selling book. has been published a number of times. And you can get it on Amazon.com along with this book. By the way, this book I'm going to sign uh, tonight because I know some of you are from different campuses and you didn't have an opportunity to come and pick up a book. So, uh, so our team will be there. And they'll answer any questions about Wagner University. Again, let me introduce uh, Benny Yang, Kitty Yang, the vice chancellor of Wagner. Come on, you guys can stand up. And then <laughs> Pastor Rob Cavell, who is our provost. And, uh, you know, he's just, uh, he's really running things uh, for us and he's doing a terrific job because uh, we have 100 new students coming in this fall. 
And we want to encourage you to just pray about even checking out Wagner University yourself. But, but the thing I want to talk about is faith and healing, and I'm just going to make a confession. This is something I've been walking with the Lord 50 years, and I'm still learning this. I've been in the healing ministry since 1974, before some of you were born. We're talking about 48 years of being in the healing ministry, and I'm just learning about healing. And so we want to have a healing service tonight, but I want to talk about faith and healing because it's somewhat complex. It's simple, but it's complex. There's multi-dimensions with faith and healing. First of all, we know that you have to have faith when you pray for the sick. James chapter 4, verse 17, it says in verse 16, if anyone's sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint that person with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith, whose faith? Well, the elders' faith, when they anoint and pray, will heal the one who's sick. And of course, uh, Jesus gave us a great commission in Mark 16. By the way, all the gospels end with a great commission. Mark 16, starting in verse 15, Luke 24, forgiveness must be preached to all the nations and then the end will come. Uh, John chapter 20, verse 21, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. That's a great commission when he appears in the upper room and he walks through the door, the resurrected body, which is really, to me, is astounding. They can't recognize him. So he looks different than when he was walking with them. And uh, I, I could go down a rabbit trail there. I have my theory on that. But you know, he, he didn't, he was not handsome, as you guys know. There was nothing appealing about him. It talks about that in Isaiah 53, that we would be drawn to him. You know, there's something about beauty that attracts people. And that's why in Hollywood, they look for people that are very beautiful because you're attracted to beauty. God created us to be attracted to beauty, even beauty of a flower. And when you see a rose that's perfect or an orchid that's perfect, you're just attracted to it or a painting not like something Picasso did where it's just splash things, you don't understand what that is, but something that is uh, something that came out of the realism, something that's beautiful. And you're drawn to that beauty. You're drawn to excellence. Why? Because it's a reflection of his nature and character. In fact, his name is excellent. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, Psalm 8. So that's why we do everything with excellence. And by the way, I want to just commend Pastor Ron and Jennifer that they do everything with excellence in this house. Come on. I love that. Even when I was getting my coffee, he gave me a menu. I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm at a five-star restaurant. He could have, I didn't even know there was an apostle's coffee and a prophet's coffee. It's just amazing. You know, it's just people who normally go, would you like a cup of coffee? They get a coffee. But here you have a menu and you have the different espresso and different shots and, uh, and uh, steamed milk and et cetera. It's amazing. <laughs> I love this house. I'll be back, by the way. <laughs> I'll come back. <laughs> and so we see, and he made you excellent. You know, he says, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which your hands have made, what is man that you would visit him, that you would care for him? But here's what it says in Psalm 8. He made us a little bit lower than Elohim. So God's order, created order, is not God and then the angelic realm, because in the King James Version, it says he made us a little bit lower than the angels. This is a bad translation in the Hebrews, Elohim. So it's God then us, and then the angelic world, we're going to be judging angels. We command angels what to do. And that's a whole teaching in itself, but angels on assignment. They're ready for our, our bidding. And he put us in charge. He gave us, he crowned us glory and majesty and gave us authority to rule over everything on earth. It's reflecting and it's affirming Genesis 1, 28. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And then he says something really interesting. He says, subdue it. So we see, first of all, multiply. We see the family institution being established right off the bat in Genesis chapter one. And then he says, subdue the enemy. That word subdue, the Hebrew word is kabas. It means subdue your enemy. And so here's Adam and Eve, and he commands them, subdue your enemy. And they're just looking at each other, just the two of them. How many know your spouse is not the enemy? 
the enemy is the enemy. The enemy was already in the garden. God had cast him out. But God expected us to finish what he began. Because we're called to rule and reign with him. He's given us that kind of authority. And of course, through Jesus Christ, we're now sons seated with him in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. It's under our feet. Satan is under our feet. He's already disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public display of them, Colossians 2, 15. And we're seated with him. That's our position. And at the right hand is a position of authority at the right hand of the Father. That's why he says, I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. We don't have to fear the devil. He has no legal right unless you sin and open the door. And I'm talking about perpetual sin. It's not like just making a mistake. You can't walk like paranoid. I'm going to blow it. No, it's not like that. The righteous fall seven times to get right back up again. And God, thank God if we sin, he, we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to deliver us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. But I'm talking about if you willfully disobey, then you're opening the door. But apart from that, you have authority. You're seated with him in the heavenly places. Now that's so important because I want to talk about, you know, part of building our faith is knowing not only who we are, but our inheritance in Christ. That's why Galatians 4, 7 is so important for me. 4, 7 says that you were once a slave, but you're no longer a slave. You're now a son. And if a son, you are an heir. It's your inheritance. And we're seated with him in the heavenly places. One of the greatest miracles that happened to us was getting $13 million in four and a half months to buy our building. We didn't have the money. When we started out in January of 2004, we had zero. We spent everything on the call prayer movement, which was stadium events. You know, I had to raise $10 million to do seven stadium events. Lou Engel was the uh, prophet, visionary founder, but I was his apostle and I had to flesh it out. I had to make it happen. And so we started in Washington, D.C., and then we went to uh, Flushing Meadow in New York, and then we went to uh, all the stadiums, including Candlestick. How many of you were at the Candlestick Park? When back, they, there's no Candlestick Park now, I mean, <laughs> but there's a handful. But back, this is back in 2002. And, and so we did these uh, stadium events, and so we had no money. And as soon as the call was over in 2003, at least on my watch as the president, got resurrected with Mike Bickle and Lou Engel in 2007. But when, uh, when I finished my term, and I told Lou, I said, I'll do the seven, I'm finishing out, that I'm going back to pastoring because I had left the pastor, turned the church over to my executive pastor to run with Lou Engel, mobilizing our nation. And by the way, the whole purpose was to pray for the overturning of Roe v. Wade, gathering young people together to pray and fast for that. And to ask the young people at the peak of the day to make a pledge to vote life in perpetuity. And these young people made a pledge to vote life. And by the way, before the call, only 43%, according to the Gallup poll, was pro-life. After the call, 52%. Something shifted because of all the massive prayer and fasting. And trust me, if, uh, if the Supreme Court, and I, I believe this is true, I, I think there was a convergence, not only having conservative constitutionalists confirmed and nominated by Trump, but they were picking up the vast majority of people who are not pro-life in America now. And so for them to make it, I think it was just something that they said, this is right, and this is in line with where people are at. And it's amazing how courts are swayed by where the people are at. I hate to say that, but, but it was a perfect coming together for us to see Roe v. Wade overturned uh, this past June. And so we had to raise all this money, and our people were amazing. People gave so sacrificially. And uh, people gave their savings. People brought their coin collection of these rare coins and just laid it at our feet. They were having yard sales. Uh, they were doing everything possible, and the money started to come in. But with four days to go, we were still $1.3 million short. And, uh, and, and by the way, we would lose a million dollars if we didn't have the whole money because we had to put a security deposit of $1 million to show that you're really serious. And if we didn't come up, we would lose a million dollars. So I was having pictures of 
front page of LA Times, pastor loses a million dollar on a stupid uh, real estate deal where he didn't really have the money to buy. You know, I was just envisioning just this debacle, mistake, this blunder that I was getting into. And of course, that's the devil lying. And so I said, Lord, I need faith. I need a word to help me through this. So I had an encounter with the Lord, and here's what happened. It was just Sunday morning, like any of it, just a few months before we need to come up with the money. And, um, you know, in our church, we have a prayer meeting before the service begins. So at 930, uh, our people, I mean, there's several hundred out there just praying, and then we start at 10 o'clock. That's just our church culture. But back in those days, we were at a different building, Mott Auditorium. And it was just the pastors, and Lou was there. We had like seven pastors at that time. And so I was preaching that Sunday. So they laid hands on me, and they were praying over me. And all of a sudden, I started to manifest. Now, I don't manifest. I did back in 94, 95 when Toronto was on. I mean, it was just powerful. Everyone shook, rattle, and roll. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> but I, I, I'm one of those oaks of righteousness. You know, I'll just pray, and I'm just there. And I'm receiving, but I'm not, you know. And, um, and so... So they're praying for me, and all of a sudden, I start shaking my hands, and I say, oh, boy, this is interesting. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to shake my body like this. And, uh, and the pastors are recognizing this is not normal for Che to, to manifest like this, so they just say, more, Lord, more, Lord, to them. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, just give him more. And all of a sudden, I'm pogoing on my auditorium floor. And my spirit leave my body, and now I need to build my fence here. I went to heaven, but I've only been to heaven twice in 49 years of walking with the Lord. And both times I didn't initiate it. It's not like I'm trying to go to heaven, beam me up, Scotty, that kind of thing. You know, it's just my spirit. How do I know I went to heaven? Because my spirit left. And by the way, scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. But I know a man, he's talking about himself, that went up to the third heavens and heard such unspeakable things. All right? And so what happened with me is I went and I saw Jesus sitting on his throne with a glory cloud around him. And I could see his silhouette figure. And my spirit went right into his body and I heard the words, you're seated with me in heavenly places. And the moment I heard that, I came back to my body and I knew we had the money. I knew it was a done deal. So how many of you know that Jesus is not standing and worried about the inflation and the high prices of gas right now? How many of you know he's not standing and said, oh my goodness, Putin invaded Ukraine and we have a war in Ukraine. Could it escalate to be a nuclear war? I'm so worried. No, he's seated. He said, it is finished. And we are seated with him in the heavenly places. But the revelation of it hit me and I knew we had the money. And so four days ago, you know, my account to my CPA, at Pastor Angie at that time, she, she just said, how are we going to get the money, Pastor? How are we going to? And I said, I don't know. But I kept on saying, it's a done deal, though. That was my mantra. That was my confession. I don't know, but it's a done deal. Because we exhausted everything we knew what to do. And now we just have to have God part the Red Sea, which is a good place to be. How I many you know that's a good place to be, where you have to trust God or die? <laughs> you know, trust God or you die. And so anyway... Anyway, um, so I, I, I'm in tears the Sunday before Thursday where we have to have the money in escrow. And so I'm in tears thanking the people. I said, thank you so much. You know, I boast, you're the most generous church in the world, seriously. You have given so much sacrificially. And I, I was just so grateful. As your pastor, I'm so honored to be your pastor. But the truth is we need $1.3 million. And we need it by this Thursday. So we're going to receive another offering. And this is after our tithes and offering. We always took two offerings every Sunday, the regular tithe, because you still have to keep the ministry going, the operations, staff, et cetera, the rent that we're paying. We were paying 35,000 rent per month. This is LA prices, okay? It was crazy. And we didn't even own it. And so it's a large auditorium, but you know, nevertheless, it was very expensive. And so we had to raise money for that, and then we had to raise money for the new building. And so I said, we're going to receive an offering. And our people cheered. They clapped at our offerings. And uh, because we've trained them, we just said, God loves a cheer for a giver. What does that look like? <laughs> and so people clapped and they were cheering. I said, we've got to receive another offering. Yay! You know. And, were, <laughs> 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 and, 
And so I said, uh, the, and so we received it and we counted immediately because we're, we're like four days away. And it was good, but it was only $80,000, only as compared to what we needed. And uh, I get a phone call and they said, I know you counted the offering this afternoon, Pastor Che. What, what was the offering? I said, well, it was good, you know, 80,000, but I still need 1.2 plus million. And then he said this to me. He's a marketplace apostle. He said, he's a businessman. He said, you know, in January, when you started to take, we've been just doing this four months. In January, when we uh, received the first million, my wife and I wanted to jump in, just help so much at that point, but the Lord told us not to give a thing yet. But wait until the 11th hour. I think you're at your 11th hour. And the Lord told us that whatever you would need in the 11th hour, we would cover the rest. And so we're wiring you $1.3 million tomorrow morning. Come on. Now, I have to be honest with you, that is all grace. It's all God. I was not my faith. He gave me the encounter to have the faith. And then I knew it was a done deal, even though it didn't make any rational sense. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So that's why he even says, by grace, you're saved through faith, not that of yourself. It is a gift of God that anyone can boast. So you can't boast in this. He gives all the glory. And so we know that it takes faith because he says, these signs will follow those who believe. In Mark 16, verse 17. In my name, you'll cast out demons. You shall lay your hands on the sick and they will recover. This is again, talking about your faith as you're fulfilling the great commission, preaching the good news of the kingdom, casting out demons, healing the sick. But these signs will follow if you believe. Do you believe? And so, it's, so that is emphasizing our faith as ministers. We're all priests, we're all kings. Can I hear an amen to that? How many of you all know you're on? I, I go to Korea. And there's a term for a pastor there, moksanim. And only those who are ordained pastors are moksanim, but we're trying to break that. We're saying all of us are ministers based on what the word of God says. We're all kings and priests. And so I would say, how many, uh, uh, you know, pastors are here, moksanims are here? And only the ordained pastors will raise their hand. And then I'll teach, we're all ministers. And then I'll say, okay, how many pastors are here? And still the same numbers go up. It's a bad, they still don't get it. And it is our mindset that we got to break. We got to transform people's thinking that we're all ministers. These signs will follow believers, not pastors, not apostles, not evangelists, but believers. How many believers do we have here? Come on, all of you. And so, so he's talking about, and then Jesus says in John 14, if you believe in me, verse 12, this is amazing, the works I do, you will do. And greater works than these will you do in my name. But the key operative word is if you believe in me. That's the condition. Truly, truly, I say to you, verily, verily, in the King James, if you believe in me, the works I do, you will do. And so we have to be strong in our faith. And yet, a lot of the healings in the gospel is not the faith of uh, the person praying, even the disciples. We see Jesus commending people for their faith, those who are sick. The woman with the issue of blood, you know, you heard, she, she had a menstrual bleeding for 12 years. She had menses for 12 years. And she just said to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, his, just touch him, I know I'm gonna be healed. But here's the problem though, when you have an issue of blood, you had to be quarantined, you could not be public. But she stepped out in faith and she was so desperate. And I do believe deliverance is for the desperate. How desperate are you for God? Come on. And so she covers herself with a prayer shawl and she goes into a crowd and finds Jesus and touches the hem of his garment. And Jesus stops because he felt power leave his body. He said, who touched me? <laughs> And the disciples are saying, hello, everyone's touching you. There's a crowd around you. They're pressing in. No, he was saying, someone touched me in faith. And he knew who it was. Who touched me? He's looking there. And she says, it's, it's I. And he looks at her and said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Why did he make that pronouncement? Because he wanted to say, not only commend her for her faith, number one, but number two, they had isolate, quarantine her. 
Sounds like the pandemic we've gone through. 14 days of quarantine, where she was quarantined for years. And he wanted her to be accepted back into the family of God. God cares about our relationship. He cares everything about our lives. And he said, I want you to bring her back because she's now, he, her faith has made her well. Amen. Daughter, go in peace. Her faith has made you well. But it was her faith. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And she had extraordinary faith. Yeah. And we see Bartimaeus, you know, and again, he says, son of David, he had more faith than the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees because he recognized him as a Messiah, even though he was blind. He calls him by the Messianic name, title, son of David, have mercy on me. And they tell him, shut up, you know, you're making a scene. He doesn't want to talk to you. He shouts all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And then Jesus stops and he says, come and calls him over. And what he does is that he throws his cloak away. Now, Randy Clark gives a great teaching on this because a cloak had a seal from that, by the, uh, the rabbi saying that he was legitimately blind and he could beg alms and you're to support him financially. It was also your, your uh, sleeping bag, so to speak. It was to cover because they were homeless. And so he throws that away. And then Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do? Which is a strange question. He knows he's blind. But sometimes we have not because we ask not. We got to be specific and say, this is what I want. I want to see. And what did Jesus say? Your faith has made you well. Faith without action is dead. James 2, 17. And so you got to act. You got to do something to have that kind of faith. But again, it wasn't the faith of Jesus. Of course he had faith. He had his perfect faith. But he commended Bartimaeus for his faith. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 14. I want to show you something here. This is, uh, I love, I love um, Dr. Luke. And um, he's the only Gentile, by the way, the only person that's not Jewish that would contribute to the Bible. Everyone else was Jewish. And, and I want to submit this to you. I believe he was a marketplace apostle. No one wrote in the New Testament unless they were an apostle. Even Mark was not an apostle, but he's writing on behalf of the apostle Peter. Are, are you following me? So everyone else is an apostle. And so I feel that he was privileged to write half the New Testament. When you look at the, the length of Luke and Acts, is half of the New Testament. So what an honor for a Gentile medical doctor. And just like doctors today uh, uh, were, uh, are successful today, and so back in those days, he was very successful, but he was like a Renaissance man. His Greek is perfect. It's better than Paul's Greek, and Paul was an amazing scholar. And so he was, he, he was just a scholar, a Renaissance man, a medical doctor, and I think he traveled with Paul at his own expense. He may have paid for Paul's travel expense because it was very expensive to travel, to leave your practice and just travel around the world at that time because it took months to go on a journey. And so it's not like flying in eight hours you're there, you know? It's like we're talking about months of buying supplies, food, and accommodation for the journey. And so we come to Acts 14. He's in Lystra. This is the Galatian area. And so when you read about the book of Galatians, it's the revival that broke out in this section of Acts chapter 14. And, and so we, we come to uh, verse eight. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, laying from his mother's womb, who had never walked. So he was born lame, never walked. And he's listening to Paul preach. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when Paul had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, not Paul's faith, but the lame pagan man of Lystra. He's hearing the word and he has faith. He saw, Paul saw, like in the spirit realm, there's faith all over this guy. So with that, he said with a loud voice, stand upright to your feet. And he leaped and began to walk and he supernaturally healed. Of course, it gets really crazy because they want to worship Paul and Barnabas. And let me just make one other point because they think he's Zeus and, and Paul's Hermes, right? And they're ready to sacrifice an oxen to, to Zeus for this incredible miracle. And they ripped their clothes and said, look, we're just men. God gives the glory. We didn't do a thing. And, uh, and, but, uh, but look at verse 14. 
But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out, saying to the crowd, saying, men, what are you doing these things? We also are men like you, with the same nature as you. But here's the point I want to make. We see Barnabas is called an apostle. And here's the point. I wrote a book called Modern Day Apostles. There are so many people who are called apostles in the New Testament that you don't realize. And we know Paul obviously was not part of the original 12, but did you know that Barnabas was an apostle? Do you know later on Timothy and Silas are called apostles? Do you know there are obscure apostles like Adronicus and Junius, which is a woman apostle in Romans chapter 16, verse 7, who are apostles before even Paul was an apostle? And so to say there are only 12, now the 12 will have preeminence. They have a special place because we read about uh, the, the, the grace and, and the reward they're going to get in the new heaven and new earth to come in Revelation 22. But to say there are only 12 apostles is a misnomer. It's not accurate. It's not biblical. He gave some to be apostles, not everyone, but some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The reason why I'm emphasizing this is because I believe apostles are the key to bring about revival and reformation. When you look at John Wesley, who grew the largest denomination in the world at one time, United Methodist, he was an apostle. He was not just an evangelist. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When you look at Wilberforce, a member of parliament that shifted things in, in the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening, he was an apostle. And so we need to recognize apostles today, and your pastor is an apostle. I want to affirm that. God's given him the grace. And so I believe we will start seeing biblical results when we get back to the biblical order. Uh, because here, here's the point. The word pastor, we believe in pastors, Amen. The pastor, the word pastor, the Greek word poimen, guess how many times it appears in the New Testament? Anyone want to give me a number? The, the leadership here, no, they're giving me their finger. Not the wrong kind of finger, but you know, they're giving me. <laughs> yeah, only one time in Ephesians 4.11. Now, there are synonyms for pastors like presbyteros, we get the word elder, episcopos, we get bishop, overseer, and they're used interchangeably. The word apostle, apostle appears 82 times. And yet we built the whole church government around the pastor. And so we got to get back to the Bible and be biblical. Can I hear an amen? All right. That's not going to cost you anything extra. It's just a side note I want to make. But he saw the faith. There was a grace that came upon this lame person as he heard Paul preach. So we see, again, individuals who are sick have faith and they get healed. So that's why I'm saying it's multifaceted, multidimensional. Now, but the key then is that how do we get the faith? Whether we're praying for the sick or if we are sick. And here's how we, faith comes. It's very simple. You know this. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. But you have to look at the word, word. It's not logos, which is the primary use for, to translate word. You know this. It's rhema, because the word of faith restored this truth. The rhema, the revelatory word. So I grew up on Copeland Hagen back in the 70s. You know, they were my teachers because I was in the healing ministry, as I shared with you in 74, and I wanted to build my faith up. And so I devoured books by uh, especially uh, Kenneth Hagen, A.W. Kenyon. You know, Fred Price, I was more influenced by him than Copeland later on. But nevertheless, I started to just read and listen to their cassette tapes. Remember those things, cassette tapes? I know it dates me, but anyway, for, let's move on. <laughs> and so, and so, um, and so I, I got, started to understand, okay, we need an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Faith comes with an encounter. The word rhema means an encounter with the revelatory word of the Holy Spirit. And that's why I love the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's why I say, for us, the presence of God is everything in our church. It's Exodus 33, unless your presence goes with us, we can't go any further. That's why I love the prophetic in our church. And, and, and so we have Wagner University, we teach about prophets and how to prophesy, we train, we have some of the very best teaching that. And we're going to have your pastor, Pastor Jennifer, teaching that. 
In fact, they're coming to our church in January to teach that. Seriously. And we're trying to recruit them to be part of our faculty at Wagner University, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm just being honest, being real. Remember, lying is an abomination before God, so I'm not going to lie before you. So. And, so, and so, um, so I love that. I love and so, but the thing is, is that sometimes we hear the word is not rhema. It goes right through, like for example, how many of you been in a meeting where a word of knowledge comes, someone has a backache, and you immediately think, well, who doesn't have a backache? <laughs> like 50% of the people here have a backache. That word's not for me. You didn't receive the rhema. That could have been for you, but instead of, you just rationalized it away. Instead of saying, Holy Spirit, that's me. I'm claiming that. That's when your miracle is going to happen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So you could hear, but not hear. It could just go right over your head. That's why one theologian said, God's constantly speaking. The problem is we're not listening. That's why I said this morning, 16 times, Jesus says more than any other things, he who has ears to hear. He's talking about not these ears, but your hear, hearing heart. Let him hear what the Spirit's saying to the church on a macro level as well as an individual level. You gotta hear what the Spirit of God's saying. And so we know that the encounter I had when I went to heaven, that was a major encounter, and, but I heard the word, you're seated with me in the heavenly places. In other words, I'm not nervous, it's a done deal. The money's there, just rest and rejoice and thank me for it. Because thanksgiving and praise is the language of faith, you have it. Because you've got to believe you have it before you see it, right? I didn't see it. The was, money wasn't there, but I had it. And that's what I'm talking about, an encounter with the rhema, the revelatory word of God. So when I pray for the sick, I wait for that word. I remember our neighbor across the street when we lived in the other, uh, before we bought our uh, home. Uh, we lived in Pasadena. We still live in Pasadena, but a different part of Pasadena. And, um, and, uh, my wife is so amazing. She is so evangelistic, but she does servant evangelism. So every Christmas, she'll give all of our neighbors around us a Christmas gift, Easter, uh, Easter basket, and she'll invite them over for dinner. We've had them over for dinner, for barbecue, just reaching out, just, again, loving them until they really ask us, why? Why are you doing this? And then we share the gospel. We just love, just love on them. And because we know, see, all my family members are saved. Sue's family members are saved. But, so we have to be intentional because I'm in a Christian ghetto. I'm just around believers all the time. So I have to reach out to unbelievers. I'm serious. And so when I get a haircut, I, I went to an unbeliever. And I went there until he got saved. And sat, in fact, uh, this is not hyperbole. Revival broke out. All nine of the stylists came to know Jesus Christ where I was going. All nine of them. And um, I didn't lead all of them to the Lord, but I prayed for them and I did share the gospel. And one by one, they got saved either at their church service or they went to a Greg Laurie Harvest Evangelism. But one by one, they all got saved. And I said, okay, I'm moving to a different hair salon because now everyone's saved. I felt my assignment was over, seriously. And so I have to be intentional about reaching the lost. And so we reached out. And so we're very sensitive. So, and she's a hospice nurse. So she's walking out to visit a patient. And meanwhile, I'm walking out of my house to go to our church office. And she waves me over. And I said, hey, what's up, Ann? And she said, I have a patient that she is 90 years old. She'd been a, she's been in a coma for three months. I think today she's going to die. All the vital signs are dropping. And so could you come and give her her last rites? And the first thing I, I'm thinking of, I have no idea how to do last rites. I'm not Catholic. You know, I, I don't know what that means. But I want to serve her. And so I thought, okay, I could just quote some scripture, pray uh, the disciples' prayer, do something, you know, just to placate her. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll come because I want to reach out to her and serve her. So I, I said, listen, I have to I have an appointment, so I'll just follow you in my car and then after... I give the last rites to your friend, or your patient, I should say, uh, then I'll go to the office. So I followed her into uh, Altadena, which is a community right north of Pasadena. Walk into a small bungalow. There's another nurse on call there. And I see this old woman shriveled up with IV, life support system. They bring the equipment there because a hospital situation, you guys know, is so expensive being in a hospital, they just basically 
look at people who are terminal, they're going to die, and they'll just leave them the comfort of their home and provide basic care. So she's in that situation. So I'm ready to just pray, you know, pray something, and the Lord speaks to me as I pray that she gets healed and comes out of the coma. I hear that clearly. But I don't want to freak out my neighbor Ann because we spend you know, all this time trying to reach out to her and not coming across as a fanatic. And I just said, you know what? I, I think it's going to blow her out. I said, Ann, do you mind if I pray a different kind of prayer? And she said, what kind of prayer? Can I pray that God would heal her and bring her out of the coma? She starts walking away from me. <laughs> She, she, she goes to the corner of the room and says, I knew you were crazy. And this confirms it, you know. I, and I said, whatever, you know, because I know I had to obey God. So I'm standing over this woman. And I said, Father, in Jesus' name, this, I, before the Lord, this all I said, I pray that this woman comes out of the coma and she hears the gospel. The moment I said that, she opens her eyes and says, who are you? She sees a Korean face. <laughs> she sees a Korean face looking at her face. So she opens and she said, who are you? I said, I'm a pastor. She said, I can't believe you're a pastor. And then all of a sudden, I kid you not, she goes into a three, four, maybe five minute speech telling me her life story. How she was brought up in Kansas. She was brought up in the church. And she knew if she died, she would go to hell. And she prayed right before she went to the coma, God, send me a pastor to tell me how I can get to heaven. And she said, I cannot believe you are here. And I said, Lois, her name is Lois. I said, God sent me to tell you how to get to heaven. And she gave her heart to Jesus Christ. The other nurse, the Filipino nurse, gave her heart to Jesus Christ. But here's the most important thing. My neighbor, Anne, when she saw that miracle, gave her heart to Jesus Christ. Come on. It's power evangelism. But it all started with me hearing the voice. I was just going to go through, you know, just being a good servant and being a good neighbor, a good pastor, just praying, you know, Psalms 23 and, uh, and you know, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, the disciples' prayer. But, but I, I just heard. That's when miracles happen, when you have an encounter. That's why testimonies are so important. Again, remember I shared Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. Because when you testify, it builds faith. I'll close with this story, and then we're going to pray for the sick. I remember um, I was mobilizing for the call, and uh, I made a pit stop in Philadelphia. We have a HIM church in Philadelphia, but it was on a Tuesday night, and I said, Jack, I'm going to come through as I'm traveling and mobilizing for the call. Uh, I could do a meeting for you, a healing service, on a Tuesday night, he said, hey, we'll love to, and we'll just have a healing service. So, so he advertised. But, but this is back before the internet. I mean, you got to understand, the internet just came in 94 for us, okay? This is around 2002. And so he just put flyers. He just printed out flyers, healing service, Cheon, and put it on the grocery stores in his city. And a woman who was an unbeliever, who had an incurable disease, saw that. And she was so desperate, she moved to Philadelphia because Philadelphia is known for all the teaching hospitals, world-class hospitals there, you know. And, and, uh, and so, so she was being treated for reflexive sympathetic dystrophy syndrome. And what that is is a nerve problem either it hits your feet or your hands with excruciating pain, and you have to be on opioids to, to manage it. And so, like, you're talking about the strongest painkiller and, um, and so she would be in a wheelchair or she could walk if she took opioids with a walker, okay? So she sees this flyer, healing service. She's never been to a church building in her life. She's a Catholic background, but not a believer. So she says, I, I have to go there. I have to get healed. I have to get prayed over. And so she's that desperate. And so we have a healing service. There were around 150 people that night on Tuesday night. And, and so I gave some words of knowledge, which I'm going to do tonight. And by the way, when I give these words, don't say, well, who doesn't have a headache? No, just say, that's for me. I claim that, okay? My job is to hear as clearly as I can, but your job is to receive it by faith. Can I hear an amen? All right. So I gave some words of knowledge out. And people got healed and people were testifying. And I said, listen, I have some time. I know a number of you didn't receive healing. So if you're sick, just come on, line up, and I, I'm going to lay hands. So it was a small enough number that it was manageable that I would just come right down the line and pray for everyone. So as I get to her, her husband's holding her, 
by um, the elbow and she has these custom made shoes. They're like slippers. And so I knew something was wrong with her feet, but I didn't have time to ask her what's wrong. But immediately I see the word abuse all over her. I can't explain this to you, but it's just a, a word of knowledge. Sometimes you just see things that you, and so I just asked her because I didn't want to embarrass her. So I just whispered, have you, were you brought up in an abusive situation at home? And she said, yes, how did you know? I just said, let me just pray, let me break that curse off. The moment I break the curse, she and her husband, I didn't even touch them, go back, fall down. And trust me, it was not a courtesy fall because they're unbelievers, they've never fallen. In fact, she had her eyes closed when I was praying. And when she fell backwards on her husband who was holding her and, and he was down, she said, did he just push us down? He said, honey, I had my eyes wide open. He didn't even touch us. And, and so I finished praying. I don't know what's going on, but it was getting really weird because everyone got up because the meeting was over, except them. They're in the same position. They're, they haven't moved an inch. And so Pastor Jack's trying to give the hand. He turns the light on and off saying, time to, to leave, okay? But they wouldn't move. And here's, we found this out. She was totally healed, but she was afraid if she moved, she would jinx the healing. The pain will come back. For the first time in 18 years, she felt no pain. And so she's there just being still. And so finally he comes to them and says, I'm sorry, this is a rented facility. We have to close up and uh, you have to leave. And, and so they get up gingerly. They don't say one word to each other in the car because they're afraid if they say anything, they're going to chance the healing. So she goes to bed and she wakes up and she said, it was just a dream. I didn't get healed. And so she gets out of bed, puts weight on her feet and she is totally healed. She starts screaming, dancing, leaping, running around the house, running around the house. And she wakes up all the kids and she said, and then finally she calls the pastor, you know, Pastor Jack and said, I, I want you to know, and, and I'm on the road. So Jack then calls me and says, you won't believe what happened last night, this woman with the incurable disease. Here's what's happened since then. I have shared that story a number of times in England and Hawaii and the United States in Bakersfield at Tony Kim Street and people with reflexive sympathetic dystrophy syndrome heard that testimony and they got instantly here healed just hearing that testimony in all three places. Amazing. One woman in Hawaii had it in her hands and she's clapping her hands and it was an evangelical conference. It was not a charismatic conference. You know, the other speaker was Shirley Dobson and they had all these uh, evangelical speakers. And the only reason why I got invited is because the guy hosting it uh, was a fellow student at Fuller and I prayed for him to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So he snuck me into this conference. And so, but it was amazing. And that's why it's so important for you to share your testimony your salvation, your story. Because when you share it, it will build faith. It will be revelatory to someone who hears it. That's why I'm never ashamed to share what Jesus did for me. This all stand up. I want to pray for you. And we're going to do some listening prayer. Ask God to give some words here. Again, I, I don't make an assumption. A group this size, there may be some who have never given their hearts to Jesus Christ. And I did not grow up in the church. I did in the sense, but I rebelled against my parents and I refused to go to church services at a very young age. I'm talking about like the fifth grade, sixth grade. And I used uh, my language as an excuse. I said, dad's in Korea and I don't understand Korean anymore. And so they said, okay, but it was my excuse to really reject God, turn away from God. By the time I was 15, I'd done every hard drug under the sun from heroin, cocaine, LSD, barbiturates, speed. I was doing, I was just out of control. By the time I was 17, I was a drug addict selling $5,000 worth of drugs every month just to support my habit. Back in those days, that's a lot of money, still a lot of money today. And what was so crazy about it is, is that I was searching. I was dropping LSD tablets searching for God. I went into a Zen Buddhism meeting at University of Maryland, uh, invited by a college co-ed, and I went there because I was searching for God. So I started getting into Zen Buddhism and chanting the stupid chant. Uh, and I'm not gonna repeat it, it's so demonic, but it was just incessant, constantly just chanting the stupid chant, trying to find God. I did that for a year. On top of that, I became, I committed, I, I, I joke about this, but it's serious. 
I committed the unpardonable sin for our nation, immigrant. I dropped out of high school because the whole purpose of coming to this country is to get an education. If you know anything about Asian culture, the Korean culture, you know, your parents pounded in you. You have to study and get straight A's. And my sister was a valedictorian. My brother was a valedictorian. I was a high school dropout. I mean, I'm, I'm just talking, but I was just out of control. And yet my parents prayed for me. And so even though no one witnessed to me, I heard the gospel when I was young, but I didn't understand it. But I remember one night when I had come back because I ran out of money and I was homeless and I, I needed to eat and I needed shelter. That's why I came back, just totally selfish, still rebellious in my heart, but yet trying to survive. My friends know I was back in town, so they invited me over for a party. It was just a bunch of guys listening to heavy metal rock and just smoking marijuana, drinking beer. It was so monotonous, we did this every day. So I withdrew to another room because her parents were out of town and I went to a room and I sat in my lotus position and started to go through my Zen chant. Now this is 73. The Beatles were into TM, Eastern religion, and, and you know, everyone was searching at that time. And of course, I didn't know there was a Jesus people movement breaking out where people who were hippies were searching and they were getting saved. But, but I prayed to God and this is what I said. I said, God, I don't even know if you exist. But if you do exist, if what my parents told me is true, that there's a heaven and there's a hell, and Jesus way to heaven, I don't want to go to hell. And so it was really a selfish prayer, but I, I was sincere. I said, I don't want to go to hell, but I just want to know the truth. So show yourself to me. Now, what I was saying in my prayer is that I'm on this journey. I've been on this journey for a year, taking mescaline and LSD, searching for God. And so I, on my journey, if you are real, reveal yourself to me, but here's what God did. He decided to show himself right there. And as I said, reveal yourself is like, I couldn't see anything, but I felt someone walk in and hold me. And I knew it was Jesus. And I just began to weep. I began to sob and I knew, oh my goodness, my parents were right all along. <laughs> it is Jesus. And I could not, again, no hyperbole. I could not stop weeping for the next three days. I didn't know what was going on. No one was there to unpack this for me, explain this to me, but the Spirit of God would just be on me and I'd just break down and begin to weep. And the next day I would just begin to weep and I felt so much of His love. That's why I love Ephesians 2 verse 4. Even though I was dead in my trespasses and sin, it says God being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us. Even when we're dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Him by grace. We have been saved through faith. It's all the grace of God. I had an encounter and I believed. And to make a long story short, within two weeks, I was completely off of drugs. And I made a decision on one day, May 25th, this is the last time I'm going to do drugs. And I've been drug free ever since. I've never gone back, never backslid. By God's grace. I don't believe you have to backslide. I feel I love him more than I did when I first got saved. I think we're to go from glory to glory in our love relationship with Jesus. So I want to pray right now, and I want us, as we did this morning, some of you are not here, but if uh, we could just pray a consecration, but if you don't know the Lord, use this prayer as a time to give your heart to Jesus Christ. Can we all pray this? Because I believe we're on the verge of the greatest revival, and as I was in prayer this morning, I heard the word Joshua 3, 5, consecrate yourself for tomorrow. He's going to do wonders. He's going to do amazing things. So let's pray this prayer together collectively, but make this your prayer. And then after that, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer for healing, okay? Does that sound okay? So pray this first with me, because this is really uh, the beginning of the healing, because you will be saved. That word, sozo, means to be made whole. So pray this with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, forgive me for all my sins. I repent. Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you all of my life. And by your grace, I will love you with all my heart. I will obey you. I will trust you and follow you all the days of my life. I receive your grace by faith. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. I receive the Holy Spirit by faith. In Jesus' mighty name. I'm going to ask you to do something right now. I'm going to ask you to put your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you and just really pray that God fill that person with the Holy Spirit. And I want you to pray this prayer. I think this is Christ-like to say, God, give my brother, my sister more than me. Just so bless them. 
Just love on them. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. I love the verse in Luke 12, 32. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's not holding back. He wants you to have it all. The whole kingdom, not half the kingdom, like Herod said to Herodias, I'll just give you up to half the kingdom. God says, I'm giving you the whole kingdom. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. <sighs> just receive his love, receive his spirit. Thank you, just receive it by faith again. How much more would the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him in faith? Now, I'm going to ask only those who need prayer for healing, physical healing. It could be also mental healing to remain standing. The rest of you just take a seat. Now, you're not going to be passive because you're going to be praying for them. I just want to see those who need a breakthrough physically. All right. Now you see the people around you that are standing and I'm going to lead you, those who are standing to repeat after me a prayer of faith for healing. And we're all in this together, seriously. I have hearing problems. I've had everyone pray for me, Heidi Baker, Brandy Clark, the best of the best. And I had surgery when I was in fifth grade in my ears and I still have problems to this day and I'm still believing for healing. So, you know, it's one thing about faith, it perseveres, you gotta contend. I just wanna please God by contending until I die. I'm gonna trust God for my healing, the side of his second coming, amen, or before I die. And so we're all in this together, there's some, because we live on a broken planet, but his kingdom is here. And the same rule and reign that healed 2,000 years ago is here to heal you. So people, see the people around them, just put your hand either towards them or put their hand on their shoulder. But I want those standing up to pray and repeat after me. Just say, Heavenly Father, I believe in your word. Your word says, Jesus went about doing good, healing all oppressed of the devil. With the authority you've given to me, I rebuke the devil and the spirit of infirmity I command this pain to leave my body. I command this spirit to leave my body. In Jesus' mighty name, now let the power of God come right now. Let it fall. Now what you're doing is Mark 16, 17, we shall lay your hands on the sick and they will recover. Not might, they will recover. And so I want those who are praying for people to be in faith. Again, the prayer offered in faith will heal the one who's sick. But those who are here, I want you to be in faith to receive, those who are standing. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some rhema words, we call it words of knowledge. And I'm gonna be as specific as I can. I'm gonna hear from the Lord. But I, I want you to claim that word because I'm getting already, there's someone here with a respiratory problem and uh, I just see lungs being healed. And if that is you, I want you to breathe in, receive your healing. It could be asthma. It could be the leftover of the COVID-19 that you had and you couldn't breathe because of that. I breathe normally, it hasn't been restored, but right now receive your healing. There's someone with a deviated septum. You cannot breathe through your nose and God's opening up your sinuses right now. There's someone with a migraine headache. I'm talking about it's debilitating. You have to lay down and you have to be in a dark room. You have to take a uh, heavy, uh, you know, whatever, medication, Tylenol, Advil, whatever, in order to recover from it but it's a demonic spirit. I break that curse over your body right now in the name of Jesus. Depression is lifting off. Someone who's on antidepressant drugs right now and God is healing you right now. There's hormonal balance coming to a, a woman here. A hyperactive thyroid is being healed in the name of Jesus. I see a heart palpitation being healed. If you have that, just say, that's for me. I claim it, that's my heart. I'm receiving that in the name of Jesus. There's someone who's diabetic being healed, and because of it, your eyesight is getting poor. And I just saw eyes becoming clearer. Now, it could be someone who just wear glasses, you're nearsighted, farsighted, but if your eyes are getting clear, claim that healing that's yours right now in the name of Jesus. 
Again, I see someone with some kind of injury to your left side of your brain. Again, is is like this pain, throbbing pain. It's more than just a headache. Headaches come and go, but you've had this pain constantly, and I rebuke that pain in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There's esophagus, acid reflux being healed. The digestive system is being healed. It was out of whack, and God's ordering that right now. Arthritis is going. Carpal tunnel syndrome is going. And I see hands being healed. So let's, let's move your hand. And by the way, when I give these words, do something you couldn't do before, just test it, okay? Someone with TMJ is being healed. You can hardly open your jaw. You have pain in your jaw. And just open it. God's healing. The pain's going away. Thank you, Father. We give you praise and begin to thank him because, again, praise and thanksgiving. There's someone who's trying to get pregnant and you've tried IVF, you've tried so many different ways, and God's opening your womb right now. In fact, if you are a couple, or maybe you're by yourself, your your husband didn't come, but if you've been trying to get pregnant, could you just wave your hand at me because I wanted to see who that person is? Okay, God is opening your womb. Anyone else in the balcony or anywhere else? Thank you, Lord. We thank you. Now, I wanted you to just take a few minutes and test. I gave like 15 words just now. Test it. And see if you see anything. Even if I didn't give you a word, but test whatever, because the Spirit of God is here. And it's your faith that's going to be released, that's going to heal. And so I want to just ask, okay, if you received a manifestation, even if it's like 50%, but you know something has shifted in your body, would you raise your hand? I want to see who you are. Okay. A number of hands are going up. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to have you come on out of your seat because there's enough here. I just want to get started just to build some faith and testimony. Everyone who have received a healing, even if it's partial, come on up here. And um, come on up on this stage. Or I could come down here. You could just come down here. Let me come down. Pastor Ron, why don't you ask them what's going on here? Come on, let's give a hand for these people as they're coming up here. I just got injections in my hands because of arthritis. Arthritis injection. And, and in my knee. And your knee. And, and I felt the warm heat. And, uh, and is a pain gone? Or? I, I, I got that like, trigger finger. And look, it's not popping. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you so much. And we seal this in Jesus' name. Who else has a testimony? What happened just now? Trigger finger, I guess, is what they call it in my thumb, and it would lock up. And Your thumb I'd, would lock? Yes, and it would like, it felt like it popped out, and I couldn't do this. You couldn't do that at all. How long did you have this problem? Uh, about four months. Four months, and now you can do it. Yes. Come on, let's thank Jesus for it. He loves you. He cares about you. What about, what about you? What happened? Same thing. My hand and my wow, foot. Wow, my goodness. All Amen. these hands are being healed. And I don't Amen. think I called out a hand. So that goes to show you that yes. the power of the Lord is present to heal the sick. Amen. And so w- tell me what was wrong with your hands. Um, it arthritis? Was arthritis, or, yeah. And you couldn't do that? And, I, well, it, would, it, would, it was very stiff and painful. A very stiff. And then my foot, um, I don't know what it's called, but um, just a step. And my heel would hurt. From 1 to 10, 10 being perfectly healed, what number would you give your hand right now? My hand? I, I, it's 100. It's healed. You couldn't do that before. Come on. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. What's going on here with you, sir? Um, I've been battling depression. I just feel like it's gone. I'm sorry? Depression. Depression. You, are you on antidepressant drugs? Um, vitamins, natural. Yeah. But you just felt, how do you know it left it? You just don't feel the pressure. The heaviness. The heaviness is gone. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for sealing this. Fill him with the Holy Spirit. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus. What about you? What just happened? Um, I feel a lot good, better release in my right hip. Today, it just hit me real bad, and it got out of place, and I couldn't hardly walk. But when you said, even if you feel anything of difference, just receive it, and I, I feel, I'm starting to feel better here. I'm so glad I came. And so, like again, from one to ten, how much improved are you? Just I'd walk say around. Eight. Just eight. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Father, we pray for total healing, top of her head down to her toes. And put your hand on your hip, where put your head, hand on your hip where you yeah, just receive that right now in Jesus' name. Come on, let's give Jesus praise and glory. Come on. All right. Now, what I want to do is I want to have more people get prayed over by the prayer team and ministry team. 
And um, I'm going to be downstairs uh, again signing books and giving you a good word uh, from the Lord. But, uh, but if you would like more prayer, uh, and if you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, come on up here and let the, one of the ministry team know that you gave your heart to the Lord tonight or you made a serious recommitment. All right, Pastor, I'm going to give it over to you.